Our guest today has hosted at the US Open, the French Open, the Olympics, Wimbledon, and plenty sports events all across the world. His writing has been in the New York Times and USA Today. He's about to hit the road again too. Let's have a round of applause in studio for Nick 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 Nick, Nick McCarvel. Round of applause. Round of applause. Oh my Twitch, that's quite the intro. All I think right. that's the best intro I've ever had. So explain to our viewers what it is that you actually do. What do I do? That's a question I ask myself every day, Switch. Um, I'm a freelance tennis journalist. I mostly work in the world of tennis, traveling about 25, 30 weeks a year, a lot of time on the road. And then I also am in the Olympics world. I've covered three Olympics now. I was in Rio last year, and I did the Sochi Olympics a couple years ago. Wow. Okay, yeah. so you interview <laughs> athletes after the biggest matches of their entire yes. life, sweating, put their most energy into it. How is that? Usually I'm the one that's sweating more. I'm the one that's sweating <laughs> <laughs> No, it's really cool. I mean, this last year at the Australian Open, we had this cool social media shack, and we got the players up there, and we got Serena Williams, we had Roger Federer come up after they had won what were historic titles for them in Melbourne. And it was euphoric. I mean, we had hundreds of fans around screaming and yelling, and I'm like live on camera trying to get these athletes to talk about it, to put into sort of short, quotable phrases what they actually just did. And they're gladiators, they're superhumans, whether they're Olympians or tennis players. What they do is incredible, and then they come and they do the media stuff, and they're just as good at doing that as they are out on the court. One of the reasons I love tennis is because it's a mental game. You're out there by yourself, no coaches, and you've got to see the match through yourself. So as a fan, how do you even prep for that? How do you stop the sweating when you're in the <laughs> midst of it? Uh, some good antiperspirant first. <laughs> no, I mean, you know what it is? It's, it's about preparing. Okay. And it's just about knowing these athletes really well. I think for tennis, it's something that I've known for a long time. It's been sort of my sport through and through, but I covered gymnastics last year and I really went into it not knowing gymnastics that well. So there was a lot of Wikipedia and there was, <laughs> I had a great editor that I was working with in Indianapolis and he sort of educated me on all the nuances of the gymnastics world. But, you know, because these sports really are living and breathing worlds in and of themselves that we don't necessarily know about. And so it's been a great challenge for me. I've done a lot of figure skating stuff too, where you just, you learn about these people and the personalities and that's what tells the stories better than the sports themselves, okay. or as much. You know, people love Rafael Nadal or Roger Federer because of who they are as people, not just as tennis players. <coughs> Saved by the Bell. Family Matters. Seinfeld. Home Improvement. Friends. Will and Grace. Rugrats is a cartoon, but it counts. <laughs> Martin. Uh, Mork and Mindy. Teenage Dream. I Kissed a Girl. California Girls. Uh, this is How We Do. Roar! <laughs> I have the... No, that's in Roar. Oh, God. Um... Sorry, Katie. Oh, shit. Anything fried with eggs. <laughs> <laughs> so what are your highlights? Uh, probably the biggest highlight for me is uh, the Sochi Olympics in 2014. I was covering figure skating and my desk literally looked out onto the ice. It was so cool covering, you know, an event that I'd watched as a kid for years and years and being able to actually be there in person and that was my quote unquote job. That was, that was pretty cool. There's nothing more symbolic than having a desk inside yeah, of the stadium. Totally. You are really working in your sports field. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. now what is your lows? Whew, my lows. I've had several blunders. Um, I thought a couple years ago at Wimbledon it was a good idea to try to ask a question in Spanish. Um, <laughs> I, took, I took like middle school Spanish, <laughs> so it did not go well. <laughs> And all the Spanish journalists were looking at me like, problem. Who is this kid? Oh, and the, <laughs> even the tennis player, uh, Muguruza, she won the French Open last year. She was like, you can ask me in English. And I was like, no, it's cool. And I just, that was quite the blunder. And then I was telling you before we came on 
that I called Roger Federer Rafael Nadal to his face. I'm just, you know, I, was, I just mixed up my words and it <laughs> happened and Roger is a gentleman and he let, he let it roll off his, roll off my shoulders. He could have just walked off set and been like, see ya. Yeah, and you would have <laughs> never worked again. I know, seriously. <laughs> my favorite tennis player of all time is Monica Seles. I grew up idolizing her two hands on both sides and she had that grunt. But more than anything else, she had that heart. How is the travel experience? It's awesome. I mean, it, it wears on you a little bit. I did Europe for 10 weeks a few years ago. We went to Rome, Paris. I went to this tiny town in Germany for a tennis tournament. Tell us more, tell and us more. And then I went to London and it was just like, you're living out of a suitcase and you're always, it, it, you know, it just, it wears on you for sure. That said, I've gotten to go to places in the world that I never dreamed of or thought that I would. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to Europe, I'm going to London for the sixth time. And now it's just kind of like, going to London. <laughs> Again, if I have to. <laughs> Getting on the train, free train. Like it just, you know, and, and that, is, that is a blessing of the job, for sure. Hey everyone, I'm Nick McCarville and we're playing a game of ballsy trivia. It's the Grunt Grudge Match. Let's go. That is Victoria Azarenka. I mean, Serena Williams, come on. That's Maria Sharapova, I know that, come on. Uh, is that Venus Williams? Yes! Come on, Venus. Oh my god, I'm fearing for my life here. Oh, that's Monica Seles, my favorite tennis player of all time, Monica. Oh, that's one of my favorites, Michelle Larcher de Brito. Oh! I'm Nick McCarville, and I just aced that ballsy trivia, the Grunt Grudge Match. Okay, so being a fan, you're seeing all of these people. You're seeing people who are your, some of your biggest idols yeah, of your life. Totally. So we had to take Serena Williams and Andy Murray and put them in a the face-off. Who do you think would win as a fan? Okay, I mean, you know, the men's and women's game are very different. Mm -hmm. I think Serena at her peak could give Andy Murray a little bit of a challenge, but I'm gonna go Murray. You know, S Serena's the ultimate athlete. So I think like a game of basketball or maybe some soccer, um, Serena never lets down. Let's say laser tag. <laughs> laser tag, Serena, 100% <laughs> Serena. Tennis to me is just like boxing. It's one man against one man or one woman against another woman. And it's a fight to the death. You have to cross the finish line. There's no scoreboard. There's no time that runs out. You've got to win that last point. Tennis is mostly seen as a white sport. It's kind of seen as, as a rich sport. Hmm. So what would it take for black guys to completely rule the sport? You know, it's funny because I, the, here's a white guy talking about this, but I want to tell you that tennis has a really rich history of being diverse. You look at the Williams sisters and what they were able to do. James Blake is a kid that actually grew up in the Yonkers and he reached world number four. Um, there's, there's so much diversity when you look at the European onslaught that has mm -hmm. come up, um, Althea Gibson, Arthur Ashe, mm -hmm. these are names that have done very, very well. And the initiative in the U.S. right now is mm -hmm. trying to get more minor minority kids to play tennis because it is a great sport. And in truth, you only need not this squishy tennis ball, but you only need a real <laughs> tennis ball and a racket and you can play. I grew up playing against a wall. You can play at any public court. New York, it's a little harder, but Which, it really is. Yeah, you gotta work those forehands. Yeah. <laughs> it really is a sport that's accessible to a lot of young kids, for sure. Yeah, in the Bronx and co-op, we have our own tennis courts and stuff. So I, we do see it growing. All right, now for an urban kid who maybe yeah. doesn't wanna play the sport, but wants a job like your job, or maybe actually your job, what would it take? <laughs> well, please don't take my job. I don't know, I'm working for it, bro. <laughs> yeah, no, I think you're wrong way. You know, I think for me, the key was always just, you set sort of your goal and whatever you wanna do and you just chase that and sort of set those little boundaries. And first off for me, it was writing and it was doing some social media stuff and then I did more hosting. And it's really just meeting people. I mean, I'm sure mm. for you and your work, it's about sort of making those connections with people and feeling as though you're, you know, outgoing and you, you know, you just try. 
But you gotta work for them and you gotta build yourself up and put in the hard work and do the research and know the people that you should know. And that, I don't, I don't think hard work can ever be replaced in that sense. I'm Nick McCarville and we're live at the Blocks TV in the Bronx. What do they do all day? Let's find out. Heading over here, it's Richard's desk. I'm not really sure why Richard wore this shirt today. Well, it was the first thing I grabbed in my- It was the first thing he grabbed. Maybe a mistake, Richard. Kristen, here's Kristen. What is this delicious snack that you have? Pasta. Pasta, wow, that sounds very complicated. Can I have a taste? It didn't go well, Kristen. It didn't go well. We tried. Okay, moving on. Oh, no, we're tethered to Kristen's desk. Okay, here's Alden, who I am told is in charge of the office. Who put you in charge? Myself. Over here, it's the hat crew, Jillian and Marco. Jillian's emailing. Email so important at the blocks. The more devices, the merrier. That's also my motto. Meanwhile, Marco looking serious, but actually doing nothing. Is that your motto? What about my boy Switch? He's over here, silent peas. But what does he do in the office when he's hanging out? Pretending to be busy. Charlie is actually doing work. We don't want any carpal tunnel here at the block, so we've got to make sure we have good mouse safety, right? Oh, so tell us a little bit about your background in sports. Oh man, I mean, I played tennis growing up. I actually grew up in a really athletic family. I'm one of six kids and we played. Mm. Basically my parents were like, everyone leave the house and play sports. So my brothers were big into soccer. My sisters were basketball track. I thought I was Jackie Joyner Kersey when I was a little kid. Like she was my everything. <laughs> um, Gail Devers and those nails. But tennis ended up being my, that was my sport. But what is your obsession with balls? <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, seriously. <laughs> Great question. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> Uh, you've never been scared to hide that you're a gay writer in this predominantly straight sports world. Yeah. How do you feel being one of only three white people in this majority <laughs> uh, minority neighborhood in the Bronx right now? I mean, I lived in Harlem for seven years and I, I grew up in Montana and moved to New York nine years ago. And I don't know, I just, you know, for as much as we all sort of are safe and feel comfortable in and of ourselves and who we are, I think diversity and being able to interact with people that are different from us, it's something that I've always tried to include in my life. Mm -hmm. And you know, yes, I, I work in professional sports and it's sort of one class of people, but it really is people from all over the world, mm -hmm. which is great. And I've, I sort of try to make that a part of my life, whether it be in, in gay culture or sporting culture, or my life in Harlem or my life on the road, that's sort of how I've tried to, that's what I've been trying to do is be inclusive. That's how you end up on this couch. Yeah. All right, so being inclusive and taking things out of their comfort area, I'm gonna give you the opportunity okay. to flip this interview on okay. me and ask me questions that you would never be able to ask some of the athletes you encounter. I wanna ask you, Switch, like, what were you thinking? That was terrible. When I woke up this morning, I thought <laughs> I would be champion. Where and why did you wear that shirt today? So, no to, one knows. Today, I wore this shirt to really try to cozy up next to you. It's actually the best shirt I've ever seen, and I'm very jealous. All right, well, thank you for being here in the interview to, today, Nick. Thank you for stopping by the studio thank and showing us some me. love. Yeah, thanks for having me on the blocks. This was a good time, and I can't wait to see Switch make his debut at Wimbledon. <laughs> How long have you had those shoes for? Not as long as you've been trying to think of something funny to say to me. So how do you actually spell switch? With a silent P, a capital S, and an old dirty witch next to it. You know the moment you leave this studio, we're chasing you the f out the Bronx, right? 